Most people, when they think of trigonometry, will think of circular trig, sines and cosines and tangents and such. Many will have no idea that there is also a hyperbolic trig with hyperbolic functions that closely resemble those that we find in circular trig. If any of you have studied hyperbolic trig, it is usually as an extension from circular trig in a calculus or pre-calculus class, requiring first an exposure to the constant e, or perhaps logarithms. But studying hyperbolas predated such considerations by hundreds of years. The ancient Greeks studied hyperbolas. They show up in many contexts within nature. They are interesting objects of their own right with useful properties and they deserve a treatment from first principles. This video is the first in a series on studying hyperbolas from first principles. Some later chapters will require you to know some basic circular trig, but for this video, it's merely helpful. None is required. So let's become more comfortable with hyperbolas. General trigonometry studies triangles of any sort. In hyperbolic trig, as in circular trig, we concern ourselves primarily with right triangles. The longest side of a right triangle is called the hypotenuse, and it sits opposite the triangle from the right angle. If we fixed that hypotenuse to be a constant value, that has the consequence of making a circle, with the radius of the circle being the hypotenuse of the triangle. And thus, beginning with triangles, we end up studying circles and periodicity in circular trigonometry. But the choice of setting the hypotenuse constant was arbitrary. We could have set a leg constant, but where does that take us? What would we end up studying? What properties would it have? We can see that if we make the hypotenuse larger and larger, the other leg has to increase as well so that we can still make a triangle. The larger we make the hypotenuse, the more similar the hypotenuse and the longer leg have to become. Since these are just right triangles, plotting them is super easy. It's just applying the Pythagorean theorem. Let's set our fixed leg to 1. This shape is called a hyperbola. At this point, the other leg is 0. So the fixed leg equals the hypotenuse. It is the point on the hyperbola closest to the center, called the vertex. Each point on our graph corresponds to a different right triangle. We've been using points from the first quadrant because we're modeling purely positive distances, but in other problems, negative numbers are a natural choice. Our algebra serves us well here. If we were to change any of our values to a negative, our equation remains unchanged. For example, negative 3 squared is the same as positive 3 squared. Thus, any of our points can be reflected across either axis. These symmetrical points also satisfy our equation. You remember how the hypotenuse and the other leg approach each other in length as they get longer, but will never equal each other. This line is where the hypotenuse would equal the other leg, and we can see that our hyperbola approaches this line, but will never touch it. This is called an asymptote. The asymptote line can be reflected as well. Our graph looks a little empty on the right and left sides. That's because we chose the y-axis to represent the hypotenuse, and the x-axis to represent the other leg. This is the graph of y squared minus x squared equals 1. If we reversed those assignments, it would look like this. This is now the graph of x squared minus y squared equals 1. This graph, with the hypotenuse on the x-axis, and a fixed length of 1, is called the unit hyperbola, 
and will be important later. These two hyperbolas result from having a fixed leg of 1, but what if we change it to a different value, perhaps 2, or 3? We can plot the fixed leg on its own axis if we plot in three dimensions. Here's the hyperbola for a fixed leg of 1, and 2, and 3. Let's fill in some of the other intermediate values. And a negative fixed leg will also satisfy our equation, so let's include those as well. Altogether, these build a double cone. Stated alternatively, each hyperbola is a slice of this double cone, also known as a conic section. Light spreading out in the shape of a cone, when cut by a wall or floor, will make a hyperbola. Having laid these simple fundamentals, the road opens before us in a panoply of questions. How does this relate to familiar triangles? For example, can you place a 3-4-5 triangle on a hyperbola? As we extend an edge, does it have to be a right triangle? Or will other angles produce hyperbolic relationships? What if we kept the difference constant as we grow the legs? Are the legs still in a hyperbolic relationship then? Our asymptotes for these hyperbolas we've been studying are at right angles. What would be needed to create hyperbolas with different angles at the asymptotes? How else might a point move in relation to a side to produce a hyperbolic relationship? What questions are interesting to you? Maybe you can find other trailheads, other paths to explore. Can you prove or disprove your guesses and intuitions? Include your thoughts in the comments section. Next time, join me for the next chapter in the series as we define the basic hyperbolic trigonometric functions. Come ready to explore. Thank you for watching.